Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word of God for the people of God. I heard Via Della Rosa in the sanctuary, and I remember just thinking, this is signature. I think I even said it. This is signature, and today, this will be a day we remember. This will be a day we remember. There are other days that I remember. This is not the first church that Mr. Quentin and I have worked at. We've had the privilege of working together. His first Sunday at the church that we worked at together, I was walking in, and I, I saw the music director, and I said, he already knows where I'm going with this. Um, I said, um, what is Rick's last name? And the legend of Ricky Bobby, Talladega Nights, had just came out. And he looked at me and said, Ricky Booby. I had no idea. I had not seen it yet. Yeah, don't watch it. And so I introduced him that day to the entire congregation as Ricky Booby. <laughs> Mr. Rick Quentin, everybody. Sometimes you say stuff and you go, ooh, I wish I hadn't said that. As soon as I said it out loud, I went, that's just not right. That's, that's not right. I do want to say a special thank you to our staff. Um, you've already seen the announcement now about Esty and Marie coming to lead our children's ministry. We're grateful for that for a lot of different reasons, one of which is Kristen Suddeth has worked in the children's ministry in both services this morning, and we don't want her working with children, so please <laughs> volunteer and step up and do help us there. I'm kidding, she's wonderful. Please volunteer. I say that for her, by the way. The staff is incredible. If you saw Andrew and Rebecca running around during the week getting ready for Love Makes the World Go Round, Shirley putting it together, obviously Kim doing what Kim does, it's, it's been an incredible week. About a week and a half ago, I, I was listening and hearing that we were running short on people to cook for Love Makes the World Go Round. So I texted Jono and said, hey, you want to cook with me for Love Makes the World Go Round? And he jumped right in. And then I didn't do anything. He cooked it all. <laughs> you got to love Jono. I put butter on tables and moved some chairs. That was the extent of my helping cook. On Confirmation Sunday, we celebrate our confirmands making public declaration. We celebrate this statement of faith of our confirmands and families. And, and these families have made commitments. Jono told you that for every time they got together, a parent was with the confirmand. So the parents were making a commitment as well in their kids' faith journey. That's not every church. Thank you for that. To the Compromise families, thank you for making that commitment. Thank you for that. But it's also a digging in and, and trying to get a better picture of who God is. We, we have been teaching them of the Trinity and, and teaching understanding and, and faith journey. And they've been getting a little John and Charles Wesley and all of that. But the central piece is as you become older, trying to get an understanding of who Jesus is and who God is. And one of the things that's happened over the last two years, and it's right at two years, is this, this sense, no, not a sense, this reality of separation, of distance. The reality of, of us learning, we always knew, but really learning just how important touch, a hug, a fist bump even. For a while it was an, an elbow bump. If you hit that wrong and get your funny bone, it's not that funny. But, but this, this distance, and, and there's nothing that's ever been in my ministry or in my life where it's ever been more important that we get this full picture of who God it is. And this is one of the moments that you heard read in Scripture that I'm about to go in. That's one of the most debated subjects in all of Christendom. When Jesus is hanging on the cross, and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 
Is he really separated from God? I mean, now we're into the Trinity. You with me? I mean, can you separate the three pieces? Can you separate the three parts? If there's a Trinity, then how could he not experience, how could he not feel God? There's another argument that what he's doing is quoting the 22nd Psalm. And it's a line from the 22nd Psalm where the, the, the psalmist David is crying out and saying, God, I feel so distant from you. And then it turns and said, but you're God. You're always going to be there for me. And so what God, Jesus is really doing is saying, this is tough, but I know that God's there. I don't know which is true. That's what you always want to hear your preacher say when he talks about the Bible. I don't know which is true. I don't know. When I get to heaven, that'll be one of the questions I ask Jesus when I ask God. And you know, can I tell you something? God's okay with us saying we don't know. God's okay with us being not sure. And in a world right now where everybody feels like they have to be sure and you got to be sure with me, there's not much more important than the faith community to say, God's got that and we're okay with that. And we're grateful for that. We've had two years of Eloi, Eloi, job loss, that isolation. As we walk through this sermon today, I hope that you will help me and hope that you remember me always going back to Eloi, Eloi. Because we have experienced the words of Charles Dickens. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Because while we have been separated, we have seen amazing videos of families saying hello to one another. We've got a Sunday school class where the average age here is about 115. It's awesome. And they will be on Zoom in their Sunday school class. There'll be as many on Zoom as in the room. This new ability to be in community with one another and what that means. It's, it, is, it is one of my favorite things to watch in 20 years of ministry. It's not just our staff. Have you watched hospital medical care providers and how they have stepped up and teachers and educators and those on front lines? We've seen what real heroes are. We understand better in my generation now than we ever have before what it really means to be a hero in our times as people have continued to serve. As Jesus hangs on the cross... It is the worst of times, but it is the best of times because that is the best of all time. It is the most beautiful picture of love and sacrifice that has ever been done. I don't know the answer to that, but instead of just stopping here, I'm going to point you back to Mark 5. Now, we're not going to do all the scripture on there because I'm going to do the whole chapter in about six minutes, hopefully. Because I believe that as Jesus is hanging on the cross, he's remembering the events of Mark 5. In the beginning of the chapter, we see Jesus with the garrison demoniac. Do you remember? There's this man who's howling at the wolves. There's this man who's howling at the moon. There's this man who's throwing himself upon the rocks, and his life is a mess. He's full of demons. The scripture even says legions. And Jesus sees it and hears it, and he casts the demons out. And do you remember what happens next? Do you remember what happens next there after he casts the demons out? The people come around, and they see Jesus at the table with this man. They see them sitting there talking normal, and they look at Jesus and say, you got to go. <laughs> you got to go, son. We were much more comfortable when we knew this man was a lunatic. We were much more comfortable when we understood the world that this guy's the problem and our problem's not so bad. But if you can do this, and if this guy's not what we knew it was and the world's different today, then we need you to go. We don't need that around here. My God, my God. We liked it better when he was crazy. I love W.B. Yeats. Do you know Yeats? Yeats, The Second Coming. It was 1919 when he wrote it. It was written at the time that the world is trying to come together and find peace and trying to find understanding after the ravages of World War I, especially in Europe, where so much destruction. 
And now we hear these words differently now. And they're fighting their way through the Spanish flu pandemic. And it's 1919 and his wife is pregnant and she has the Spanish flu. And in the second coming he writes, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. 103 years later, is it any different? It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. After returning from the garrison demoniac, Jesus is walking through a crowd when a synagogue leader grabs him and tells him, my daughter is dying. Please, sir, come hear him. This is a man who is the leader of a synagogue. He is a leader of a group. He is going to have influence. He's going to have privilege. He's going to have all these things, and it's all failing him. And so he goes to Jesus and says, I, I've heard what you can do. I know what you can do. Come and, and, and save my daughter. She's dying. And so he begins to go that way, and he's got this huge crowd following him, huge crowd all around him. And while he's doing it, he feels on his, on his cloak. He feels this pull on his cloak. And see, what had happened that was there was a woman who had been suffering for 12 years. For 12 years she had been suffering. And doctors and physicians, no one can help her. But she believes if she just touches that cloak, that'll be enough. And so she reaches out and she grabs the cloak. And Jesus feels it. He doesn't feel the cloak. He feels the power leaving from him. And he says, who was that? And the disciples say, look, Jesus, look, there's, there's no way to know who that was. He goes, who was that? And she says, it was me. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. My God, my God. Can I talk about the difference between hope and faith and optimism here? Optimism believes that tomorrow is going to be a good day. Tomorrow is going to be a great day. Hope knows that tomorrow may not be good. Hope knows that tomorrow may not be any better than today and the next day may be worse. But hope knows who walks through with it with us through it. Hope knows who has the future in his hands. Hope knows that while we may feel abandoned and lost, that our Savior Jesus Christ does as well and will not abandon us. And faith, faith believes in the one who hung on the cross for us and knows where to place it. He feels the cloak. This woman who is sick and tired. I don't know if you've ever known this feeling. She is sick and tired of being sick and tired. But she has hope. Emily Dickinson said, Hope is the thing in the soul with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. No matter how bad things get, we don't stop. We not only have hope, we have faith. Remember that Jesus is on his way to the house of the synagogue leader when he's touched. And as he begins to move again, they come and they tell the synagogue leader, they come and tell Jairus, they come and tell in the presence of Jesus, you might as well go on somewhere else, she's dead. Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, she's dead. And so Jairus looks at Jesus, and you can imagine the anger. You can imagine the frustration that this, this man has lost his 12-year-old daughter. His daughter has died, and Jesus talking and being in the middle of all this stuff, and he, he's this leader of the religion, and Jesus, it should have been for me. It should have helped me. Doesn't he? And he's gone, and Jesus looks at him and says, it's all right. Don't worry. Have faith. Do you know how strong you got to be to look at a man who's getting ready to bury his daughter and say, I hope you've never had this. I hope you've never walked into the house of someone who's buried a child or burying a child. It's horrible. It's horrible. The wailing. The wailing that Jesus is going to be hearing now. But for anyone who has... You know the wailing's not what haunts you. It's the silence. 
that no one can speak, that knees no longer work and you cannot even stand. And Jesus looked at that and said, don't worry, have faith. When he walks in the house, they're gathered around him. When he walks in, everybody's wailing and crying and they're... And they look at him and they say, she's gone. And Jesus looks, I don't know if he smiled or what, but he looks at them and says, she's not dead. She's asleep. And Mark tells us they laughed at him. They're not laughing with him. They laughed at him. And Jesus walks to the back. And I love this part. This is the Jesus part that you just want to hug him for. We'll hug him for it one day. He grabs her by the hand. Talitha, come. Little girl, stand up. And she stands up. And she walks. And Jesus, being Jesus, looks at everybody and doesn't say, I told you so. He doesn't say, are you listening now? He says, give her something to eat. Give her something to eat. My God. My God. One of my favorite hymns, one of my favorite songs is Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Over the last two years, we have really learned the importance of holding hands, of hugging, of being connected, of loving one another, of caring for one another. But that lesson was always there. It was always there. Can I go back to the cross? As Jesus hangs, I don't know if it's a hymn to show that he's got faith. I don't know if he's really feeling distant. But I do know that he was thinking of Jairus and his daughter as he said, my God, my God. And I don't believe Jairus was there. I don't believe the, demoniac, the former demoniac was there. And I don't believe the woman was there. Mark would have told us if they were. But I do know he was picturing them. I do know he was thinking about them, and I do know he loved them even if they weren't there in his darkest moment. Brothers and sisters, my God, my God, no matter where you've been over the last 2, 5, 10, 20, 25, 30, 50, 75 years, our God adores you. No matter how broken, busted, a mess, scared, mad, nasty, petty you've been, our God adores you and is literally waiting at the door, waiting to come home, waiting to welcome with open arms and joy and hope and peace. Confirmands, as you grow up, you're going to have hard days. As you grow up in your faith, there's going to be times that you are disappointed and people disappoint you. Here's what I hope you remember from this day. That no matter where you go, no matter what you do, God goes with you and adores you and loves you. That God loves you and is always holding you in the hollow of his hands. And what we are hoping today is that this journey, beginning today in a manner worthy of God, is that you always know that you are loved by God and the people around you, whether you like them, love them, or can't stand them, God loves them too. Let's try to be a little bit more like God every day. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and sing.